Self-attention is something that us human beings do quite instinctively. And nowadays, machine learning models are doing it as well. Is there anything these AI models can do that us human beings haven't been already doing for the past thousand years? Welcome to this new episode of Neural Breakdown and this is part two of my series on going from neural attention to transformers and covering all the foundational principles. In this video, we are talking about self-attention, masked attention, and more topics that further builds the knowledge that we need to eventually understand transformers. This one is not just about the what's and the how's. I'll cover all of that, but it's also about the why's. Why does attention and self-attention work? Why is it so universal? Why should we learn about it and try to understand its true nature? And I'll try to answer all of those whys based off of my understanding of it and share one of the most enlightening interpretation I've ever heard about self-attention that really made me understand the beauty and insanity of all of this and really blow my mind. I also do want to highlight that this video is going to use a lot of the concepts in my previous one. So if you haven't already watched that one, you should totally check it out. That one really tries to explain the ideas behind the attention mechanism, building straight off of first principles using a single simple real world example of a movie recommendation system. It goes into all of the foundational concepts like what are the keys and queries and values, the attention matrix, dot product attention, context vectors, multi-headed attention, language translation, and other things as well. If you like this video do hit the like button subscribe to the channel leave a comment because your feedback means a lot to me every time i get a kind comment it generally makes my day it generally makes me happy and it makes all the effort that goes into producing all of this really worth it to me so thank you you guys are magnificent don't let anyone tell you otherwise let's get into it so self-attention is a type of attention network where the key, query, and the values all come from the same input. This is different than the cross-attention schemes we talked about in the previous video, where the keys and queries come from different sources. For example, in the movie recommendation example, our queries came from the search string, and the keys came from all of the movies in our database. And similarly, for language translation, the query came from the target English sentence, and the keys came from the source French sentence. In self-attention, we don't have two sources, just a single list of items and their initial independent embeddings. These embeddings are derived solely from the respective items and are completely unaware and unconditioned on the rest of the items in the list. The goal of self-attention is to then output new embeddings for each item which is contextualized on all of the other items. As an example, let's say we have a football or a soccer team of five people. A, B, C, D, and E, who start off by knowing nothing about each other. So they all have their own independent embeddings. But then this self-attention guy comes along and he says, hey, item A, have you met item B, C, and D? No? Okay, meet them and tell me how relevant they are to you. Or oh, what's that, you're a striker? You might want to give a lot of attention to B, who is also a striker, and a good bit to C as well, because he's a midfielder, but a tiny bit to D, who's a defender, and probably not much to E, who is our star goalkeeper. Okay, now that you know the attention scores you want to give to each of your teammates, here is your context vector, which is just a weighted mean of their initial embeddings, and the weights come from your attention scores. This context vector is a representation of player A's environment, encapsulating his relationship with his teammates in the context of the team. Let's add this context with player A's own initial embedding, and voila, now his original embedding has been enhanced, and he is no longer an individual, but a part of a whole team and this is his unique identity in the team, a mixture of his own self and the relationship he shares with each of his teammates. Uh, what is also amazing about self-attention is that the context vector is unique for each of the players. For example, player E, who is the goalkeeper, might want to have a lot of attention for the defender D, and not so much for all the other players, so his context is different and unique. Player C, on the other hand, who is a midfielder, probably needs to give a healthy attention to all of his teammates, so his attention scores are probably going to be close to an equal or a uniform distribution. Of course, this team-based example is kind of contrived, and it's not really practical, but it's an effective way to illustrate the point. Let's now go into some more practical use cases for self-attention. Uh, let's say you have a sentence. A sentence can be looked at as a team of words or tokens. Each token can be independently embedded using word embeddings and their positional encodings. And when passed through a self-attention layer, we can obtain enhanced representations for each token that are context aware within the entire sentence. Often we can also add a dummy token in the input, maybe at the start of the sequence. And then the output embedding of this dummy token is considered as the sentence embedding of the entire input sentence. 
This embedding can be used for sentence level classification like sentiment analysis, whereas the token level embeddings can be used for token level classification like entity tagging or part of speech tagging or dependency parsing. The patterns we see emerging out of self-attention models on textual data is super awesome and intriguing to see as well. As you can see, this is a super powerful tool for representing not only an entire collection of items, but also each of the items individually in the context of the collection itself. Um, sometime later in the video, we're going to have a why section and answer why self-attention is so powerful. But before that, we need to first understand how. How does self-attention work? So internally, self-attention works pretty much exactly how regular attention works. The initial embedding is converted into the keys, queries, and values through three different neural networks called the key, query, and value networks. We then do a scaled dot product attention followed by a softmax to obtain the attention matrix, which if you recall the previous video, tells us how much attention or weightage a given word should provide to all of the other words in the sequence. And then a weighted mean operation is done with the values to obtain the aggregated value embedding, which basically is our context vector. Also quite often we add the initial embedding vector with the context vector again, sort of as a residual connection to maintain a strong relationship between our final output and the initial embedding. And by the way, if you found some of the stuff here slightly difficult to grasp, or if you're unfamiliar with these terms like keys, queries, attention scores, I urge you to go back to the first video because I explained all of those in great detail in that one. Meanwhile, I want to discuss something super interesting, the question of why. Like why does this architecture work so well and why is that it can be applied to so many different and diverse domains? I heard an explanation of this in a talk some years back and it totally blew my mind and I'm going to share it with you guys today. So on the surface, it's kind of obvious why self-attention and attention is, in general is such a powerful tool. As we have discussed in the past, it can contextualize information across different sources to form this unified learning space. It can also provide a unique identity for each item in a collection by deriving a unique context vector. But what people don't talk about much is how it's an adaptive learning framework. Uh, let me explain. So we all know about MLP layers. They are the most common unit in any neural network architecture. If you zoom in and look at a linear layer, it is simply a multiply add operation. You multiply the input tensor with the weight matrix and then add it with the bias vector. If we did self-attention on an input where the embedding dimension was one, much like the linear layers, we also get another embedding of dimension one. But self-attention uses three neural networks instead of one neural network and also does all of the softmax and, and weighted mean stuff. And if you do a complexity analysis, the linear layer takes O and D squared, whereas self-attention with all of the query value embedding and all of that takes O and D squared plus O and squared D. What exactly is it achieving with these additional operations? Here's what it improves. In traditional multiply add scenarios, the same weight matrix and bias is applied to all inputs. The weights do not change according to the input at all. W and B are fixed for any input you pass in. But if you rearranged the self-attention formula a little bit, you'll see that it is basically the same as a WX plus B formula. But what is different is that both W and B depends on the values of the input. This means that with attention, we are basically training an adaptive layer that can manipulate its weights depending on the input it sees. It still blows my mind. In other words, instead of handing the neural network a fixed set of weights and biases, we are empowering the neural network to generate its own weights and biases given the input that it sees and then project it into a different space. The final topic we will discuss here today before calling it off is the concept of 
the masked attention, which is a very, very integral topic in deep learning. Now, suppose we purposefully want to block certain tokens from providing attention to certain other ones. Suppose we have a sentence, but while producing the embedding of each token, we only want to contextualize it with past tokens and none of the future tokens. This is a key building block behind generative language models like GPT that produce sentences by generating token after token. Each token can only look at the past tokens because none of the future tokens exist yet. So we can't train models like GPT with just regular self-attention because by default, it contextualizes the items with each other in a bi-directional manner. And instead, we do masked self-attention. For an input sequence of length n, we construct a n by n attention mask matrix, denoting which index is allowed to attend to which. The first token just attends to itself, so we have 1 at the first place and the rest are 0. The second token attends to the second and 1, so it looks like this. The third token can attend to the first three tokens, and therefore the first three numbers are 1 and the rest are 0. If you extrapolate this, we end up with this nice little right triangular matrix, which is also called the causal mask in the literature, because it simulates the causal relationship of the input sequence. The easiest way to use this is after the q.kt dot product is computed, we replace the parts where the mask had zeros with negative infinity, or like a really high number, like minus 10 to the 9 or something, and retain the values where the mask was 1. And then when we take the softmax of this matrix, all of these negative high numbers become 0, and all of the real numbers combine to become a probability distribution. This is what we wanted to simulate in the first place as the context vector of any given input will only provide attention to the things that came before the querying token. The fun thing to note about this is that we can apply it to any graph. If you want to provide attention to the last four, maybe mask will look like this, and you want to provide the attention to the last and say the next, it will look like that. If you wanted to apply it to any arbitrary graph, we just need to find its adjacency matrix representation and use that as the attention mask. We now have all of the tools that we need to talk about transformers and I believe that will be my next video where we're going to use the self-attention, cross-attention, masked attention, all of these building blocks to finally understand transformers. All right, I'm going to end this video here. This was a pretty loaded one. So for those who made it to the end, thank you. And I'll suggest to check out my video on the segment anything paper, for example, which uses all of these concepts I mentioned here in a novel fashion to make an interactive image segmentation model. I did a video on the history of NLP where I talked at length about how transformers work and what role attention plays in it and all of the current challenges. So I invite you to go check it out if you're interested, but hope you had a good time. Don't forget to subscribe because you're going to love my next video. Bye.